Chloroplast and mitochondria are what we call bioenergetic organelles. These uh, organelles used to be free living bacteria. So in human cells, we generate our energy in what are called the powerhouses of the cell. These are mitochondria. They used to be bacteria that were free living bacteria uh, that entered into a symbiotic relationship with the host cell some two billion years ago. That changed the way uh, that life looks on the planet because before that, before the origin of mitochondria, all microbes on earth, all, all life on earth was basically bacterial. It was the size of small prokaryotes, never got complex, chemically very good, uh, able to do photosynthesis, but unable to make large complex cells and la large complex organisms. So that were, those are mitochondria. All complex cells, that is cells that have a nucleus, have them. They're called eukaryotes. And some eukaryotes have an additional endosymbiont, a very important one called the chloroplast. The chloroplast are the organelles of photosynthetic activity in higher plants. They're what make plants green and they are the solar cells of plants. They are the compartments of the cell that transform light energy into chemical energy and food. Uh, they're the basis of the food chain and they're very, very important. Chloroplasts also used to be free living bacteria, so-called cyanobacteria, that is photosynthesis in eukaryotes, in the plants and algae, is not an invention, it's an inheritance. They, stole, okay, the, the eukaryotic lineage stole a bacterium uh, from nature to become uh, uh, photosynthetic itself. So bacteria have this one peculiarity that is horizontal gene transfer. They can share packages of DNA sequences with each other and adapt really quickly to the environment. Some recent studies suggest that horizontal gene transfer is an underappreciated process in evolution and that the tree of life is not the only exclusive pattern depicting evolution. Sometimes we should talk of the web of life. What do you think about this debate? I think we have to distinguish between prokaryotes and eukaryotes very clearly. It is true that prokaryotes transfer their DNA uh, all the time across species boundaries and actually with almost no respect at all for higher taxonomic boundaries right, within the prokaryotes. There are three mechanisms uh, of gene exchange among the prokaryotes. They're called transduction, transformation, and conjugation. What's interesting though uh, among the prokaryotes is that of those three mechanisms, only the conjugation, only the plasmid, actually involves physical contact of cells. Right? In um, transformation, that is the uptake of naked DNA, or transduction, uh, transfer by phage, the donor cell and the recipient cell never see each other in the environment. It's just an interaction between the cell and DNA. No, so that's, that's prokaryotes. It's important. It's the basis of their, of their uh, genetic recombination. Okay, in eukaryotes, higher cells, like humans, plants, animals, fungi, that does not occur. We have a different mechanism. It's called meiosis. Professor, you also dedicated a lot of your research to studying the origin of life. According to your research, what is the physiology and the habitat of the last universal common ancestor, that is, the first forms of life ever appeared on Earth? This is a, an interesting question. We're certainly not the first people who have looked at this question. And uh, you can look at it from comparative biology or comparative genomics. Those are the typical ways. So when genomes came along about 20 years ago, people said, okay, well, let's go in and let's look at genomes and find all the genes that uh, are common to all cells. And that turned up about a list of about uh, turned up a list of about 30 genes that are present in all sequence genomes. These mostly are genes that are involved with exactly that process of translating 
information from the genes into proteins that are the uh, functional units of the cell. We took a different approach recently. We asked not what is universal, we ask which, which genes are ancient. And uh, this question relates very much to your last question about lateral gene transfer. So we've known for about 50 years that there are two basic kinds of prokaryotic cells. These are the simple ancient cells. There are cells called bacteria and cells called archaea. They have different cell walls, they have different cell membranes, they have the same genetic code, but they represent the deepest divide that we know in the living world. And so from genomes, it's been possible to say, well, if we have a gene that was present in bacteria and present in archaea, it must also have been present in the last universal common ancestor, also called LUCA. The problem is lateral gene transfer. Maybe the gene was invented in one lineage and then transferred over here so that it's present in both lineages today, but it wasn't present in LUCA. And so what we did was try to filter out uh, the lateral gene transfers so that we could get a clearer picture. We took uh, all genes from 2,000 genomes, that's about 6 million genes, we clustered them into families, they fall into about 250,000 families, and then we made trees, phylogenetic trees, uh, gene trees for all of those genes. And among those we found that about 11,000 trees had representatives both in archaea and in bacteria, so they're candidates for LUCA, but 97% of those were actually due to lateral gene transfer. Only about 3%, or a list of 355 genes, fulfilled simple phylogenetic criteria for being present in LUCA because they were ancient. That list was very interesting because it revealed uh, a, 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 a large number of new insights, not only about how LUCA processed information, we already knew that, but where it lived and what it lived from. On the bottom line, LUCA lived from gases. It lived from hydrogen and CO2 and carbon monoxide, nitrogen, H2S, very primitive sorts of substrates. But there are many microbes today that can live from exactly those gases. LUCA was extremely anaerobic. It had many, many enzymes that are very oxygen sensitive. That makes sense because oxygen is the product of cyanobacteria, the same bacteria that gave rise to plastids. And at the beginning of evolution, there were no cyanobacteria. That came later in evolution. So LUCA was an anaerobe. That makes sense. LUCA also had um, genes that indicate that it was a thermophile. That means it liked it hot. All right, and it also needed metals, lots and lots of metals, basically rocks. If you look at iron sulfur clusters in modern proteins, they perform much of the hard catalysis uh, in microbial metabolism, and LUCA was full of these iron, nickel, sulfur clusters. That means that it lived in an environment where there were volcanic gases, it was hot, uh, there were rocks, and um, that looks exactly like hydrothermal vents, okay? That is exactly the kind of environment we find today at hydrothermal vents uh, at the bottom of the ocean, and that's the picture that we derived. It was very exciting because it gave us a, the, the previous investigations that had just told us about Luca's information processing didn't tell us about where it lived. Professor, you also received the a uh, very particular prize recently. <laughs> yes, yeah. Can you tell us something about it? Ah, that was very nice, yes. It's the, uh, the, the prize of what's called the Clue Foundation. These are industrialists in Germany. It's a very nice prize. It's 25,000 euros. And uh, the, I guess the, the in, most interesting aspect of, of that, uh, it, was, it was for our work on early evolution and on, on LUCA, was that at the award ceremony, the person who spoke the laudatio uh, to congratulate me was none other than the Archbishop of Berlin, His Excellence Dr. Koch. Uh, and uh, that was very surprising that an Archbishop would uh, say good things about an evolutionary biologist. Uh, I was very pleased about that. 
And there was a great deal of pressure on me to say something sensible <laughs> in reply to the archbishop. I did my best. Uh, the archbishop actually requested then uh, my 10-minute speech, and I wrote it down. And today, it was just published on the website of the Archdiocese of Berlin. It's in German, but it can be translated. And if anybody's interested, this is an example of productive dialogue between uh, science and society about the question of where we come from. Right? This is interesting. Every society on Earth has questions about where we come from. And every society has answers. Also, scientists have answers. But we have to be careful because the difference between the answers that religion provides and science provides are interesting. In science, the truth keeps changing. The facts keep changing. That's the job of scientists, is to generate new facts or new insights. And so everything that we believe today, we have to be careful because in 200 years, scientists might be laughing out loud about many of the things that we think today are true. We just have to keep that in mind as science progresses.